Um, I am a professional dog trainer. Uh, my heart really is in shelter work and also working with dogs who have little behavior quirks, fearful dogs, just reactive dogs, and also dogs who live with little kids and find it all a little too much to handle. So those are kind of my favorite areas. Another favorite area of mine is enrichment, and which means kind of keeping your dog busy in a variety of different ways that kind of fit with their natural behavior, natural instincts. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. While we were setting up, I hope you had a little bit of a chance to just kind of skim through this slide um, because this is the organization that we have to thank for the fact that we're able to videotape the presentation today. So a lot of people will be able to um, view it later who couldn't make it today or didn't know about it today or live kind of far away like, like I do. So here we are, anytime, anywhere, all weather, all season, fun for your dog. I think the last few days especially have reminded us how hard it can be to entertain our dogs when we don't want to go outside with them. <laughs> Luckily, there's lots of other ways we can amuse them. And again, um, this talk is sponsored by your dog's friend. Um, Deborah was just talking about the mission, and it's a wonderful mission. It's a great organization. This is the third time I have spoken here, and I'm so honored to be invited back again and also to be chosen to be videotaped. Um, and the videotaping is, again, thanks to a grant from Maddie's Fund. So thank you, Maddie's Fund. Who has heard this old chestnut? A tired dog is a good dog. I do know that some people think it means run your dog until they're ready to collapse so that they'll sleep for the rest of the day and not bother anybody. I don't think you think that, right? But there's this question, what does it mean to tire out a dog? And what is a good dog? And so I wanted to unpack it a little bit. What I think we're really asking is how much, how much exercise does my dog need? Sometimes you go to the shelter and they say, this is an active dog, it needs two hours of exercise every day. And we think, oh, that's not the dog for me. I don't think I can exercise two hours a day. Well, most of us don't. And frankly, most dogs don't either. If you're thinking vigorous cardio workout, uh, but that's not the only thing we mean. But when we talk about exercise, there's a few considerations we want to get out of the way first before we start going into the hows and, and you know, what do you do's. Um, these, these are questions for your vet. How much exercise is too much? This is an important question. Um, it depends on the breed. It depends on the age of the pet. It depends on the health of the pet. It depends on a lot of things, things that I have no business telling you about your own dog. These are questions that are really important to figure out, but they're questions for your vet. Um, young puppies, often they're not supposed to go for long walks until they're a certain age. Their growth plates are not closed yet. Older dogs have more trouble regulating their temperature, um, you know, their body temperature. So, but ask your vet if you have any questions at all about how much might be overdoing it. <laughs> this one's also hard. It depends on the dog. Um, I'm a little embarrassed that I walk my dog in a big orange coat when it gets below freezing. But I know for a fact she's cold because I can look at her and tell. You can't always tell, but often if you just take a look at your dog and see if they're shivering or if they're eager to get inside. I mean, when in doubt, you can always put a coat on your dog. When is it too hot? This is a life-threatening situation. If it's too hot, especially if you're running with your dog, it is possible to do the unthinkable, you know, run your dog. Well, I won't even say it. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Again, it's a question for your vet, but it's something to keep in mind. If you wonder if it's too hot to run, don't run. Um, but, you know, just keep these things in mind as you think about how and when and how much to exercise your dog. Then there's the question of when, what happens when it's not enough exercise. <laughs> I think we all know. Um, you start getting this kind of thing, right? 
dogs who are like, oh, I'm so bored. Let me just pick through the trash. Or let me just pick through more trash. Or let me get into the kind of trouble that will let off some steam for me, but is going to make my person really annoyed. But I think it's a good idea to kind of be mindful of what kind of trouble your dog gets into when they're, you know, being naughty and maybe haven't had enough exercise or enough stimulation because they're doing the things that they like to do, right? So dogs are scavengers, right? They like to go around looking for food, raiding the garbage. They like to rip things up, don't they? Sometimes people worry, oh, you know, I was a home, uh, I, I was away, my dog was home alone and shredded up all my um, lovely decorative pillows on my sofa. I'm afraid he has separation anxiety. There's a whole list of diagnostic criteria for separation anxiety, but it's also the case that some dogs just like to rip up pillows. So, and th that dog looks very relaxed now, now that he's destroyed the couch, so you tell me. <laughs> uh, so we get back to this adage about a tired dog is a good dog. There's a number of parts to being tired. And what we're talking about when we're talking about tired is really, we're talking about meeting a dog's behavioral needs by giving them a lot of chances to just be a dog. We know what happens when a dog is bored, right? We don't want our dogs to be bored. That's where the trouble starts. What makes a dog tired isn't necessarily, you know, doing an Ironman or, you know, training for a marathon. It's doing dog things. It's following their instincts, the, thing this, the things that they're hardwired to do, finding outlets for them to do those things in a way that doesn't destroy your house but gives a dog a chance to be a dog. That's my dog. She will be <laughs> starring in several videos. Um, before we go any further, let's just talk a little bit about the nose of a dog uh, because this is the primary sense um, for dogs. The way we use vision to understand and appreciate and experience the world around us, dogs use their sense of smell. There's nothing in the world they would rather do than smell stuff. Um, just to give you a sense of the acuity of a dog's sense of smell, these are some analogies I found interesting. So dog's sense of smell is 10,000 to 100,000 times more accurate than ours. But we don't really smell, you know, we smell something like, oh, the brownies are almost ready to come out of the oven. Oh, delicious. Or we smell like the things our dogs roll in and we say, oh, mmm. But we don't really use our nose all that much to you know, perceive our surroundings. We only notice when it's really good smell or a really bad smell. But we look around all the time. We really rely on our eyes. Um, if we can see something that's a third of a mile away, a dog could see that 3,000 miles away. That's not to say dog's vision is that way. It's comparing their sense of smell to our sense of vision. So something that was clear to us at a third of a mile, they would see at 3,000 miles away if their sense of smell were vision, okay? Does that make sense? It just gives you an, a sense of the scale, the scope. Uh, they can detect some odors in down to parts per trillion. That's a pretty small amount of a smell. And that's, if we compare it to our sense of taste, we can taste a teaspoon of sugar in our morning coffee. It's not enough for me. I need more like a tablespoon or two, but a teaspoon I could probably say, yeah, there's a little bit of sugar in here. If you put that amount in a swim, in two, uh, the amount of water, it's like 10 million gallons, two Olympic sized pools, a dog would be like, yeah, there's sugar in those two Olympic sized pools. So their nose 
is an exquisite organ for experience their, experiencing their world. They are hardwired to use their sense of smell to investigate, to amuse themselves, to follow interesting things. Um, the more we can enable our dogs to use their noses for a whole wide variety of different things, the better. Which is why I put sniff on the top of the list. So if a dog had a to-do list, these are the things that might be on it. You could probably think of others, but I think these are the main ones, right? Sniff, scavenge. That means they are hardwired to go through their environment looking for food everywhere, any kind of food, rotten, not rotten, possibly rotten, and figure out, solve the puzzle of how to extract it from wherever it is, from wherever it is hiding. They chase things, right? They're also, they have predatory instincts. They like to chase stuff. Squirrels, cats, rabbits, guinea pigs. All those live in my home, not the squirrels, but I have rabbits and guinea pigs and cats. And my dog does enjoy a little bit of you know, teasing chasing, not predatory chasing. Um, they eat, and we can take advantage of that. We're going to talk about that a lot. They nap, they explore, they dig, right? <laughs> Who has a dog that likes to dig? Yeah. And that's not a bad thing if you can set it up in a way that you can both live with, right? Um, they like to chew. They like to rip stuff up. So, we have lots of options for keeping them busy. Something that's really, really important to keep in mind is making a dog tired, meaning meeting a dog's behavioral needs, isn't just about physical exercise. It's also about mental, mental stimulation. Um, and an example I always like to give is, think about when you are on a long drive and you're the driver. By the time you get where you're going, you've been sitting still like this. You haven't moved, you haven't broken a sweat, you haven't gotten your heart rate up, but how do you feel when you get there? You're tired. Why? I don't know, I think it's from concentrating, it's from you know, focusing. So think of that when you think about mental stimulation. Mental stimulation can be equally tiring. Think of, how many people have kids? Okay, how many people used to be kids when a long time ago? <laughs> so at least we can all kind of think back. Think about preschool or kindergarten, how the classroom time is structured. You've got, you know, like circle time and song time, and then you've got maybe outside play time on the playground, and then you come in and you do, you know, practice your numbers, and then you maybe go outside again, and then you have lunch, and then there's nap time. You wake up from the nap, you have Play-Doh, you have, you know, dancing or uh, whatever, and then you have maybe cleanup time. It's structured like it's broken into little increments of, of activity, and they kind of alternate between active and kind of calm. And dogs kind of operate this way too. You want to structure their day so that they're kind of alternating between activity and rest, activity and rest. Dogs rest a lot, so we can take advantage of that. Um, and I like to think of their sort of energy for activity as, you know, water filling a cup. So you get that energy out, maybe you play a little fetch in the yard, and then you should be able to, the, you know, dogs should be able to come back in, kind of hang out for a while, and then that glass is going to refill. And before it spills over, they're going to need something else but they don't necessarily need a 10 mile run. They might need to have a frozen Kong while lying comfortably on their bed, or they might you know, wanna play a little game of tug, or, but there are lots of ways. It doesn't have to be all day long. Um, yeah, so some of us have dogs who we think of as high energy, or there are other, or people will say, oh, your dog has a lot of energy, huh? Yeah. Um, and it goes kind of back to the preschool, kindergarten example where, yeah, little kids have a lot of energy too. We don't know where they get it from. Uh, probably s they siphon it off us. 
and they, you know, use it to make us crazy. <laughs> My kids are teenagers now, so. Um, but that energy is, it doesn't need to be unloaded all at once, right? It's like portioned out and then interspersed with rest. So when we think about, when we think about a dog who has high energy, sometimes we're talking about a dog with high arousal, which means they have trouble settling down. That's a different issue. And for that, if you have a dog like that, we can talk about it after, um, but I always recommend people look into Dr. Karen Overalls. She's a veterinary behaviorist. She has this relaxation protocol, which involves teaching your dog to love just lying still on a bed, no matter what else is going on. It's really great for dogs who just never thought about, you know, resting, like that resting would be a fun thing to do. Okay. So, let us begin. How many people feed their dog from a bowl? It's most of you, yeah. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> if you want to occupy your, oh, here we go. If you want to occupy your dog in the way that most suits their kind of genetic wiring and their instinctive tendencies, they, Think, that, think about that they like to uh, look around for their food. They like to work for their food. They're scavengers. Yes, they are predators. They can chase things and kill them and eat them. And they do. Um, but they're, by nature and by, um, you know, by evolution, they are scavengers. They separated from wolves you know, t tens of thousands of years ago when they started kind of hanging around human communities and eating the trash that people left around for them and gradually they became more and more incorporated into um, those little societies. But they're scavengers. They're hardwired to skulk around, finding food in the environment, however little bitty, tiny, itty bitty it may be, however firmly lodged under a rock or a log or a whatever, however rotten it might be, however disgusting it might smell, they want to find it, they want to eat it before anybody else gets to it. That's what they do. So when we feed them from a bowl and they eat it in 30 seconds, and then they look at you like, okay, now what? Maybe we could say to ourselves, well, that was probably like 100 pieces of dry food. I could have used every piece of that for, you know, sort of incorporating some kind of like scavenging exercise for my dog to, to give them something fun to do with their food. Um, this is how dogs would spend their time and their effort uh, if they had the opportunity. It's the most natural thing for them to do, look around for food using their nose. Yeah, and so since scavenging involves a lot of problem solving, you wouldn't think necessarily that you know the world is a puzzle for dogs but it kind of is if you've seen well i'll show you a video but so consider the possibility at least of holding some of your dog's food back out of the bowl and using it for some of these you know enrichment activities that they might enjoy a lot a lot more than just gobbling out of a bowl interactive puzzles um Outside around the corner, there's a whole shop. Um, there's all kinds of, uh, like this. Can you hold that up for everybody to see? I don't want to embarrass you, but I think, yeah, it looks kind of like a bird feeder. Um, what it does is it, well, it doesn't do anything. It just sits there. But you put food inside, and your dog says, it appears there is food inside. I would like to eat that food. How am I going to get it out? And usually they'll sniff it and they'll nudge it and they'll paw it and then they'll bash it and they'll crash it and they'll smack it around the room. And it can be really noisy and really <laughs> obnoxious, but it is so fun for dogs. There are many, many um, variations on this. One is this IQ ball. My dog loves it. Everybody I know has a dog who, you know, who has an IQ ball 
loves using it with their dog because it's just fun to watch them. They get so excited. They can't wait till you put it down on the floor. And then my dog immediately starts barking at it, like, give me a kibble. Ah! And she bashes it all around the room and she empties it. And then there's another and it takes her, I don't even know, it takes her, she's pretty good at it, but you can adjust it to make it harder. And it takes a long time for a dog to eat this way because they're eating and they're playing and they're solving a puzzle. So it's like a triple whammy. Um, a Kong is a great um, vessel for wet food. Yeah, you can, um, you can stuff a Kong with wet food. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, if you have a high energy or high arousal dog who's like busy, 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 never has enough to do, feed them their whole diet in a Kong. You can freeze it, it'll take longer. And when you think about it, like, like this is a dog eating a Kong. I don't know what's in it, but she likes it. Um, and look, look at her body language. She's relaxed, she's lying down, she's licking, which is very soothing. So this is an activity that's like self-reinforcing. Lying down, being calm, licking, and eating. So you get this whole effect of like, I love my Kong, I love my bed, I love my food. I love lying down and eating my Kong on my bed. So it just really contributes to a sense of relaxation. And I have a friend, <laughs> I have a trainer friend who has a uh, American Staffordshire Terrier. It's a pit bull type dog. And they're kind of, you know, we won't, don't want to stereotype, but they're known for being like always ready to do things. And she said, I've had dogs all my life, but I had three hounds before. When I got this dog, I didn't know how much dog she was going to be. She was just always, always, always on the go, ready. You know, let's do, let's run, let's play, let's. And she said, I just got like five Kongs and I mixed her dry food with water. This is one thing you can do. I've tried it, I find it too tedious, but you can, you know, find ways to um, put your dog's regular diet, either dry food or wet food or combination, in the Kong. And she said, I just, and I froze them put peanut butter around them, froze them, and I just had her just eat out of Kongs all day long. And it made a huge difference because she started to just enjoy like lying and licking and just being. Dogs love to hunt for their food. So if you have a yard or, you know, go out on the sidewalk, the little strip of grass, put your dog on a long leash, scatter the food and watch them. Where is it? Where is it? Where it? Sniff, sniff, nibble, nibble, sniff, sniff, nibble, nibble. This can take, well, it can take as long as it takes, you know, <laughs> until the food is gone. Um, you can also do it inside. And I love to do this. I do this every day, morning and night with my dog. I put the food all over the house. I lift up the area rugs, put some under there. I put them in boxes. I put them under the flaps of the cardboard boxes. I put them, like, I open drawers and put food in there. I taught my dog to open the drawer by pulling on a, you know, a tug. So I put the food in there and I close the drawer. I throw them in the recycling bin. I throw them, I, I throw a lot and then I hide a lot. And it will take her, I don't know, half an hour to find them all. And then she goes to sleep. Um, and my mom, said, my mom said once, when she first saw me doing this, she said, why don't you just give it to her? Why are you making her work for it? And I was like, just wait. Watch what she does when I take the food out. And of course, she was doing her happy dance and, you know, barking and <laughs> happy. And she started hunting. And so, like, yeah. I mean, you might like your food in a bowl. You don't want to eat your food off the floor. However, you are not a dog. Um, this is another thing you can do with it. Take a handful of kibbles and just throw them. This is, I don't know if you can see in the background, it's a, it's a kiddie pool full of plastic balls. Um, a lot of daycares have this, I think. I haven't invested personally in a kiddie pool full of balls just for my dog because my house is cluttered enough and I don't need a swimming pool in my living room. But 
it is a really fun way. Um, you drop the kibbles into any container full of any objects that your dog would have to paw through or, you know, root through, take things out to get to the kibbles. And um, you can even put, like, my son loves Legos, and I put kibbles just in the Lego box, and then she has to, you know, sort, 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 sort. So that's fun. And then, like we were saying before, you can freeze stuff. And that promotes licking, and it also takes a long time, right? In the summertime, you can have them outside, you know, working on a big block of ice with all kinds of goodies in it. Um, these are Kong stuffed with, uh, your guess is as good as mine. Frankly, you can put anything in a Kong that your dog likes. Um, I had leftover lasagna the other night, and I just stuffed a bunch of, um, you know, these marrow bones, frozen marrow bones. Um, I give them to my dog, and then I save the bones, and I just stuffed all of them with leftover lasagna, put them in the freezer. <laughs> so now every time she's giving me puppy eyes and it's not ready for, it's not time for dinner, I send her to her bed, I wait a little bit, and then I give her a bone full of lasagna. And it's like this big, but it takes her like 15 minutes to get it out. Long-lasting chews, you were talking about marrow bones, bully sticks, antlers, hooves, um, bones that are raw, not cooked. We all know that. Um, uh, so the first two are just for chewing. Some dogs like to just chew a thing, and some dogs really need it to have some flavor. Marrow bones, I don't buy them from the pet store. Sorry, pet stores. I buy them from Giant, and they're just in the butcher, you know, the meat section. They are called, like, soup bones or whatever they're chopped into, and they're dirt cheap. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, bully sticks, they're pretty, you know, just, and also just keep in mind, the first two are for chewing, the second two are pretty rich, like calorie dense. So, you know, all things in moderation, right? Another thing to keep in mind, I, I included this picture because I just want to remind you, especially with these long-lasting chews, the, more, the longer a dog spends with a thing that, that is valuable, the more the dog is like, oh, this is definitely mine, and no one else can have it, which is reasonable until you're like, oh, it's time for me to you know, uh, take you for a walk, so let me just have that bone and put it away for later. And your dog says, oh no, you, you did not just do that. Some dogs will let you with no problem, but a lot of dogs will feel like, are you kidding me? That's my bone and you just took it. Or some dogs will, you know, just give you a hard time. It's always better if you have to, it's better if you don't have time to let the dog finish the long lasting chew that you um, be prepared to trade something of equal or higher value, but something they can eat quickly, rather than just taking it away. Because if you take something away, maybe the first time, eh, you know, fine. But if it happens enough, then even the most mild-mannered dog may start to feel like, ah, is nothing in this world mine? And you don't want to create that feeling like I have, you know, like the dog has to take their thing and hide or take the thing and guard it. You don't want to build up a resource guarding habit. So just always be prepared to, what I do, if my dog has something and I, I just need to move her along and take the thing and go on to the next thing, I just take a handful of hot dogs. Maybe she's here. I take a handful of hot dogs. I put them near enough that she can smell them. She looks up. I toss them. She gets up to go get them. I take the thing away and I put it far away so that it's just out of sight, out of mind. And this is where, you know, we were just talking about like marrow bones and bully sticks. They're pretty rich, they're calorie dense. They're a great treat, but not for all the time, all day long, every day. So now some dogs are, they really just want, you know, meat. Uh, on the other hand, there are some dogs that will eat just about anything, and my dog happens to be one of them. Um, and so I'll show you. Okay, so this is my dog. Her name is Huckleberry. 
Oh, make it bigger. It's a head of lettuce. And so while, while she's doing that, I'll just tell you, a head of lettuce is one of my dog's very, very favorite things. And I think it's because I have rabbits and, guinea, and a guinea pig. And so when they get fed, she gets very interested. And then as a reward for being nice and polite, if she'll go to her bed and lie down, then we throw the head of lettuce, the, just the, we call it the butt, the lettuce butt, the end of the head. And she'll just, she'll just eat it. And look how long it takes her. Not every dog is going to eat lettuce, but a lot of dogs have a, a more adventuresome palate than we, than we might expect. So you can try popcorn, you can try carrots, apples, green beans. These are popular with a lot of dogs. And then if you're giving Kongs and mixing things into dry food or wet food, you want, and you want to stretch them so you can make more Kongs, or you want to like lighten up the calories, you can combine them with anything your dog likes. Yogurt is a good choice if your dog likes yogurt. Pumpkin is a good choice if your dog likes pumpkin, and it's also good for their digestion. No grapes, no raisins. We don't know why, but some dogs are very sensitive to them, and they are toxic. Again. Okay, so these are, you know, some of the more traditional ways of getting our dog. You know, all, oops, I just fumbled my, uh, am I okay? Am I back online? Yeah, you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, you know, we're pretty familiar with the idea that we take our dogs for a walk and that's a good way to get some exercise. I think sometimes we think the walk is for physical exercise, which it is, but it's maybe more important that we give our dogs a chance to explore what interests them. A, a long time ago, before I was a trainer, before I knew what I know now about animal behavior and dog's instincts. I used to get so irritated with my dog. I had a dog that sniffed everything. Oh, my current dog sniffs everything too. I mean, most dogs sniff everything. And when you're thinking, I want to get some exercise, I want my dog to get some exercise, you're like, come on, come on. And I see people all the time like pulling their dog along. Come on, come on, pulling them away from a smell, pulling them off something. And now I always think like, oh, don't do that. Because to me, the walk is like a visiting, it's like visiting a museum for a dog. If you think of it this way, every place your dog stops to smell is like a museum exhibit. And they're just taking it in. Maybe it's a painting. Ah, ah, they want to step back and look. They want to get closer. It's an experience, right? Um, maybe it's, I don't know, it's like, they're learning something. They're gathering information. It's important to them. We don't know why they're sniffing poop. They're sniffing, you know, something invisible. But you can tell by the amount of time they spend doing it that it's really important to them. And for me, it's like, it's like uh, turning off the, it's like when you're on an airplane and you're watching a movie and then it's time to land. And it's like the climax of the movie, but the plane has to land. So they turn off the movie and you're like, but what happened? So tearing a dog away from a smell, I mean, you know, sometimes we just have to keep walking. But think of it from your dog's point of view if you can. We can't really know what they're thinking, but this is what they love to do. So if you, oh, I should just go back. Um, I hate this kind of leash um, because of my personal experience with it. And I'll tell you one thing. I had a dog who became kind of a jerk, like an aggressive, I loved her, but she became aggressive to other dogs when she was old. And she once broke away from, from me chasing another dog on a retractable leash. So I feel like you don't have as good um, control and they can get ahead of you and away from you much faster than you would be aware. And then I saw, there's a guy who walks his dog in my neighborhood and he, his dog always, his dog really likes, wants to go, ha, wants to have a, a little, you know, interaction with my dog. And he walks the dog on a retractable leash. And, uh, you know, same thing. The dog pulled him down on the ground and then he let go. And then before I knew it, the dog is, you know. So I don't think you have as good control with a retractable leash as you do with a long line. Although 
it does take some practice to learn how to kind of reel it in and let it out, and reel it in. So just be aware of that if you're, you, know, you don't want to use your long line on your first walk um, on a busy road. I walk my dog on a 20-foot leash usually, and you know sometimes I have to keep her right here. Sometimes I pay it out all the way, <laughs> so 20 feet she can, she just gets to choose where she goes. And it's a good way of practicing recalls, you know, like if she's at the end of the rope, um, the leash, and I say, Huckleberry, come. And then she comes, and then I give her a treat, and then I let her go again. Or um, it's, just a, it's just a nice, the more um, animal behavior experts look into this question of what, what do animals need, what are their primary needs, the more we, we, I'm not an expert, the more I listen to experts talking about their research, um, the more it appears that freedom of choice really is a primary need. It's as important as food, water, <coughs> shelter. It's something that, you know, if, if animals never get to make their own choice about anything at all, um, it's really detrimental to their whole sense of well-being. Uh, so I highly recommend, at least occasionally, giving your dog some, you know, some, some freedom on a longer leash. You can take your dog to many places that you might not have thought of. Um, the first thing to be aware of, the first caveat is make sure that your dog truly enjoys this kind of outing. Make sure it's not just you. <laughs> enjoying the concept of bringing your dog along to places that you like to go. Um, I see a lot of dogs who love these kinds of outings, and I also see a lot of dogs who are just like, ah! You know, they, either they've had enough or they've had too much. People are petting them. They don't really want to be petted. You know, so know your dog. Know whether this is a good thing to do with your dog or not. Um, but most pet smarts, most pet, I shouldn't say most, in general, pet smart, petco, Home Depot, et cetera, have a dog friendly policy, which means a well behaved dog can come into the store with you. Not every single one has the same, upholds that policy. Um, and they, individual stores have a right to choose. So we all know that our dog, our, each of our, each of us has you know, our dog, who is the best dog in the world, and how could anyone not love them so much and put up with anything they do? But when we bring them to these places that are dog friendly, we really have to think about how to respect the privilege and how to maintain the, um, the willingness of these businesses to keep letting us come in with our dogs. And so you want to call ahead, make sure, I don't, I, depends on the establishment, right? At Home Depot, I have been known to just kind of walk in and just be ready if someone says, oh, no, you can't have your dog here. I just would politely leave. I've never been asked to leave. Um, but you want to maybe call ahead and make sure that this particular store has that particular policy. Practice manners, bring really good treats, you know, have your dog practicing being on her best behavior. Give people space, you know, even though the... Um, even though the business allows dogs, and apparently a lot of the people who run the business like dogs, not everybody likes dogs. I know, I don't understand, but it is what it is. So these are the don'ts. These are kind of obvious. I mean, I'm sure you guys wouldn't do any of this, but um, don't overstay your welcome. If your dog's starting to get antsy and vocal and being a real, you know, kind of had enough, it's time to go. And I know I don't even need to say this, but uh, I won't even say it. Other people should not pretend that their dog is a service dog. That's not a good thing. But nobody in this room would ever do that, so it's not even worth saying, right? Okay, we talked about digging. Once again, the star of our show is my dog, Huckleberry. This is my backyard, and just look. Look how fun, this is a short, this is a short one. She's not done. <laughs> okay, here. 
All right, so like, watch it one more time and I'll just mention. This is in a part of my yard that is not a very nice part of the yard. It never was, so I don't really care about it. But if you have a dog who likes to dig, you can set aside a little part of the yard. You know, you can even put a little, you know, folding fence around it, maybe put some, you know, treats and dog food in there so it's, you know, that's the place to be. Just let them tear up a little hole, just a little hole. We talk about, we say she's working on her project. Um, every time I take her out in the yard, which is pretty much every day at lunchtime, she digs. And what I think she's doing is there are little rodents who live underground. She's trying to get them. And I just imagine they're like, oh, in their little tunnels. They're underground trying to get away from her. And she's digging trying to find them. But she'll stop and she'll <laughs> sniff. And then she'll look. And I can just imagine she hears them and smells them moving away. And then she starts digging again. And she'll dig, I don't know, she'll dig as long as, as, long as she wants, you know. I go inside, I hide her food. She's out there digging. So, yeah, we don't want our dogs digging up our plants and digging up our lawns. Um, okay, so dog parks. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm not the biggest fan of dog parks. Um, probably a lot of you aren't either, I'm guessing. I mean, word has gotten around or people have had certain, you know, less than positive experiences. However, there are times when playing with other dogs is a great fun activity. I just really caution people, don't go with a really young dog because they're, you know, one bad experience can make them very fearful for life. Um, if you must go, go off peak when there are just very few dogs there. Don't stay long. Supervise like crazy. Make sure you have a pretty good recall. Maybe sh make sure that if you call your dog, you can kept, you know, uh, you can recall them away from a situation that's getting out of hand. Better yet, maybe, you know, find another way. Not every dog loves that environment, and a lot of dogs really find it a little too much. If you watch dogs play naturally, they tend to play in pairs. Um, there's so much communication happening. It's hard for them to, you know, to analyze the behavior of all those dogs swirling around them. But in pairs, it's easier for them to sort of interpret like, oh, are we still playing? Yeah. Oh, um, I just bit you, but I didn't mean to hurt you. Okay. There's a lot of subtle, like, you know, subtext that they can read from each other that they can really only read like a little bit at a time. So there's an app that I love. It's got a lot of interesting information. Um, if you're interested, you can download it from iTunes and probably the other um, Android too. These are some alternatives. If you have a dog that really loves to run, but you don't have a place. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so if you have a dog that wants to run, sometimes there are places you can take them. You could take them maybe to a big baseball field that's fenced, a tennis court. Um, you can get them on a really long line and you know step on the leash if they get. If you um, if you're letting your dog run on a, on a long line that they're kind of dragging, make sure you have your dog on a harness, not, not just attaching that to the collar, because if you need to step on the leash to stop the dog, you don't want to choke them. You want to, oh, so funny. You want to be able to stop them quickly, but you want the tension to be on the chest or the back rather than around the neck. Um, okay, and this is just more stuff, fun stuff, games. Um, tug is a great way to get some energy out of your dog and play a little fun, nicely contained game. Some people say, oh, you should never play tug with your dog because it'll make them aggressive. And I don't know, you know, uh, that's a whole other, <laughs> you can't really make a dog aggressive. And you really can't say, oh, that dog is aggressive. Aggressive is a behavior at a moment in time. You don't have aggressive dog. You have dog behaving in an aggressive way in a certain 
situation. But anyway, the way to prevent things from getting out of control with tug is you have rules. You teach your dog, give, take, drop it, those kinds of things. And as soon as the rule is violated, if it's violated, you just drop the toy and the tug is over. It's a dead toy, it's not fun anymore. In order to start playing again, your dog has to behave and play by the rules. If you, are play if you have a kid who's playing, make it a long, like a rope tug. Just dogs should know where their teeth are, but sometimes they get you know, a little overexcited. This is something that you can buy out in the hallway. It's a flirt pole. It's like a big cat toy, and I have a little video to show you how it works. Ready? Here's a game you can play in your backyard. I wouldn't take it to the park yet or do it inside. I'm gonna give you this flirt pole, this toy to play with. Um, it's important that you kind of do it right though so that he doesn't go flipping and flying everywhere. Griffey, come here, ready to play? I'm going to drag the little toy on the ground and try not to let him get low, but he's really good at getting it. Sometimes he lets go, you can drag it. It's best to go back and forth rather than in circles if you can. And then he catches it, whoa, and then whoa, he misses. You can also play tug when he does get it. Well, that's fine too. And you can either wait till he lets go or you can kind of, he just play growls in this. I want you to know he's just playing part of the game. It's very excited and it's a great way to exercise him in your backyard. Whoa, Rafiki, there you go. Okay, I'll take a cut and I'll do another one so I'll show a little more. Notice what the puppy's doing and notice what she's doing. She's just standing there. She doesn't have to do anything if she doesn't want to. And the dog is just getting such a workout and it's fun and it's, you know, it, it sort of incorporates that predatory behavior, but it's, but it's not real predatory behavior and she talks about playing tug and so it's a great way to get you know to play with your dog in a small space and get a lot of activity something that i want to mention um, we talked about high arousal before so with some dogs playing you know kind of wears them out so that they're it gets their energy out they use it up and then they're ready to rest other dogs and uh, exercise play revs them up and then it's hard for them to come down and they need some kind of transition so sometimes you know that's a good time to like bring them in and give them a kong so they can just you know go into relaxation mode but another way if you're going to play this kind of game or really any kind of active game is to incorporate um, breaks where we're calm so in sort of interspersing play crazy play with sit wait, down, leave it, that kind of thing. So you build impulse control as part of the play. And so that helps dogs kind of regulate so they don't get, their arousal level doesn't ratchet up too high so that you have trouble bringing them down. Oh. Mm. And notice she was keeping it on the ground. I don't know if I turned the volume up soon enough. She was keeping it on the ground. If you look on YouTube, you'll find lots and lots of flirt pole um, videos. Uh, I like the idea of keeping it on the ground because you will see dogs leaping through the air and going into all kinds of dangerous contortions and dogs can actually really get a serious spinal injury if they land wrong. So, um, tricks. Tricks are fun. Tricks are for kids. Um, if you have kids who are old enough to interact with your dog, um, either, you know, if they're little, you supervise. If they're teenagers, they can, you know, you can kind of press them into service to entertain the dog uh, on their own. Um, but these are all tricks that are fun to teach. Catch is just, you know, throw a treat in the air and your dog catches it. Throw a treat in the air, your dog catches it. Some dogs are naturally good at it. Some dogs have to learn. But it's kind of fun and it's an easy trick and also it occupies their focus and their effort and it's a good way to you know, keep them busy. Um, spin, these are, all, uh, these are all tricks that are easy to teach because you just need a lure. You need a really tasty bit of food and you can teach a dog to turn, you can teach a dog to crawl, you can teach a dog to 
bow just by kind of putting the treat on their nose and leading them around with it. Um, and high five is, it's a little more complicated, but it's still, it's a really fun trick. And dogs, a lot of dogs really like to show off their tricks. So once you have trained them to do the tricks, then just asking them to do the tricks is a fun way. All right, so this is especially useful if it's pouring rain outside or if it's freezing or it's really hot. If you have a set of stairs, you can have your dog going up and down, up and down the stairs as, long, as, much, as many times as they're willing. And you can throw a toy down there or a ball or a, you know, treats or, or um, dry food and just scatter it around and have your dog go down the stairs, run up the stairs, down the stairs, up the stairs. Some dogs love to do stairs, some dogs eh, not so much, but uh, it is a good way to get some get some energy out. Oh, and you can practice your recalls. Send them down the stairs and then call them back up again. Come. Um, I love this book. I'll just mention it. It's by Colleen Pilar. She's a local dog expert. She's in Alexandria. Um, she gives talks here sometimes. She's wonderful. She's written this book. I swore by this book. For I've, I, have, I read this book after my four-year-old was bitten by our family dog. And I thought, what have I, what did I miss? And um, I recommend this book to everyone who has kids. She talks about how to manage these, you know, interactions between dogs and kids from babyhood all the way up through teen teenage, the teenage years. And it's just practical advice. But, you know, these are some of the games she recommends that you can play, that kids can play with their dog. Hide and seek, you know, where you, they, kids hide and then call the dog and then give them treats when, they, when they're found, teach, you know, working on recall, fetch. These are all you know, games that are fun for kids and dogs to play together. If your kids are young, supervise. Um, nose work. How many people have heard of nose work? Yeah, in this area, it's become very popular. So it's basically like your dog pretending to be uh, bomb sniffing dog or a search and rescue dog or a drug detection dog. But really they're just looking for, in the beginning they just look for treats, which is super fun. And then if they go in at, to higher, more advanced levels, then the dogs are searching for really for odor like birch and I forget which other. There are like two, there are three, they're national competitions. It's a huge thing. But you don't need to join a, you know, a, you, you can take a class, you can take an informal class, or you can, you know, you can go to nationwide competitions if that's your cup of tea. You can also do this at home, you know. Just hide food under flower pots, or, you know, hide food, you can ha send your dog to another room, and then hide a treat, you know, behind a chair, and then call your dog to come in, and let your dog hunt around and hunt around until they find these are just all ways that we can harness our dog's natural instincts and give them a chance to be a dog in a way that also works for us in our household. Some dogs love bubbles. My dog is like, eh, but mm, my dog eats lettuce, so you know I have that, I have that to uh, to crow about. But try it. Bubbles are. Fun. I love bubbles. Bubbles are fun. A lot of daycares will sometimes. Oh, you know what, we were to, let me just go back. I don't think we need to go back to the slide, but let me just talk for a minute about daycare, doggy daycare. Has anyone ever sent their dog to doggy daycare? Yeah, some people. And do you feel like your dog really loved it? Yeah, so some dogs love daycare. Some dogs find it a little too much. Um, it is basically like an all-day fraternity keg party. And, you know, just like in college, some people love that kind of thing. Some people, maybe not so much. Or maybe when you were in college, you did, and now it's hard to imagine. Make sure, if you're going to send your dog to doggy daycare, make sure it's a place that's run by people who know dog behavior, who have, who have a very structured schedule. You don't want your dog playing all day long. You don't want your dog in a group of 20 dogs playing all day long. You want them to match dogs, 
into groups that have like similar size, similar play style, similar age. Um, you don't want your puppy with the you know giant bully breeds and kind of just trying to make it work. You don't. You want um, the staff not to use kind of aversive uh, methods for controlling the dogs. You want dogs that um, you want a daycare that enforces a rest period. You know, like. Throughout the day, they should be they should be crated and rested, and brought back out. When I first started hearing about these things, like a long time ago, when I was just thinking for my dog, I thought, "What? They take breaks? Why? They should play all day." But no, that was the old me, <laughs> pre-trainer me. They need structure. They need downtime. Um, so, and you should be able to go to a daycare place and observe, observe freely. Um, you should, they should also require your dog to be assessed to see how they do. Normally, you would have, you know, they would have one dog who's a daycare dog, and then your dog would go and interact with one dog. If that goes well, they would bring out another dog, observe, assess. So, you know, just some things to keep in mind about responsibly run daycares, and um, there's a lot more to it than than meets the eye. So uh, buyer beware. Not in the winter, of course. Well, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> what's the difference, you know, between a kiddie pool and a bathtub? I was just thinking in the winter, I suppose, if you have a dog that loves water, you could put them in the bathtub. But no, I've never met a dog who likes to get in the bathtub. However, there are a lot of dogs who like to get in the kiddie pool. So if your dog is one of them, it's a fun way to keep them cool and give them something to do. You can do agility indoors. You don't have to go to a you know agility competition to you know let your dog do agility kind of behavior. You can just be at home, and if you are inclined, you can build all your equipment out of PVC pipe. Uh, you can also just use your furniture, you know, like you can use, um, you can use a chair. Teach your dog to go, well, this one won't work because, well, for a little dog it would. If you have a very small dog, they can go under. You can just lure them around with a piece of food. You can get your dog to jump on the couch, jump off the couch, if you let your dog on the furniture. Um, one thing I like to mention is this is a good way to teach your dog off. Because off is the opposite of on, right? So if you teach your dog to jump on something, then you can teach them to jump off something. And once they understand that behavior, then if they're messing around, like trying to get food off the table or something, or they're somewhere you don't want them to be, and you say off, they know what you're talking about. I see a lot of people you know, say off, 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 off. And the dog has no idea, you know. It's like, why? I'm, I'm eating this pie here on the kitchen counter. I don't know what you're on about. I'm busy eating the pie. But if you have taught your dog this pair of behaviors, on, off, on, off, then you have a much better chance of getting your dog, if they're already in the pie, forget it. But if they're about to and you say off, if you've really, if you've really trained it well and rewarded it like crazy, then they're going to know what off means or leave it. Um, but that's not, leave it isn't something that you can, you know, that you could teach with on, off. But if you say off and your dog has never learned off, doesn't know what it means, you're just talking to yourself. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can use furniture. I like this one. This is a dog having a good time inside. Mm. I think my ears are shaped wrong for this mic. Either that or I keep fumbling with it. Um, this is a dog having a great time, right? Just flying around the house. And it doesn't have to be flying through the house. It can just be, you know, in a very controlled way, climbing on things or, you know, scooting under things or um, through things. You know, anything can be like a, we you know, for weaving. Um, it's just up to your own creativity. 
speaking of creativity, um, this you got to see to believe. I don't think there's sound. It doesn't really need sound. <laughs> and she's just got a piece of food, and she's just leading the dog around. <laughs> That is, isn't that fun? Oh, I think I need to. Uh, and these are just, uh, well, these, <laughs> come on. These are a few books. Um, I think Deborah has a handout that has more books on them, but these are three that I love. Um, do you have it on handout so I can just, or do you, I'll, I'll wait for a minute for everybody to write it down if you want to write it down. This is 10-minute um, dog training games. The woman's name is Kira Sundance. Um, I mean, she just performs with Weimaraners, but she's got a lot of fun games in this book. And then Play With Your Dog by our very own Pat Miller, who's in Maryland, and she's a phenomenal trainer. And uh, this book called Brain Games for Dogs, that is also a really nice resource to have if you're looking for ideas. And that's it. So now we have time for some questions if you, oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. So now we have time for questions. So let's let them. Let's see. You had. You were the first one who had a question that I couldn't take. So let's let's start with you. Um, so my dog also retriever has the bubble bolts already, but I happen to have the one gold retriever that's not too well motivated, and it's uh, even my like, struggle to get her to eat from her bowl unless I put like ground beef in it or something. What do you recommend for dogs that just generally don't like eating? How do you recommend doing like these hatons and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, yeah, did you want to? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. The question was, um, I have a dog who's not really that food motivated. So how do I use food for enrichment if my dog doesn't really even like to eat? It's a good question. One thing I have to say, though, is Dogs must eat. All living things must eat. So they are motivated intrinsically to eat. They may have preferences about what they eat. Not every dog loves their dry food. Um, you might think about, you might talk to your vet about switching to another food. Um, some foods are just more palatable than others depending on the dog. So, and have you tried wet food too or just? Yeah, well, that's, that's between you and your dog. That's your dog saying, hmm, I'm going to hold out. Oh, okay. So, sorry. So, um, the problem is when 
her dog gets high value stuff, then her dog says, well, I don't need to eat this other stuff. I'm just going to stick with the Kongs. And I said, that's a negotiation between you and your dog. When a dog is hungry, a dog will eat. And so it's maybe a matter of switching up the dry food to something more palatable and also just not letting your dog be the boss of you, <laughs> unless you don't mind. Yeah? How do you use the food game when you have a multi-dog household? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, if you're able to kind of separate, oh, OK. I'm a slow learner, evidently. How do you use interactive food, toys, and puzzles when you have a multi-dog household? Um, I would say if dogs, well, there's almost certainly going to be a little friction, probably more than a little with a lot of multi-dog households. So if you can separate them, send one outside, keep one inside, close doors, you know, have one room. They don't necessarily need to have the whole house at their disposal. They could just, you know, um, have one zone of the house at, at one at a time. How many dogs do you have? Three. Three. Yeah, so get creative, huh? <laughs> um, back here. Um, yeah, you're st the one standing up in the back. I, I actually have something to contribute to the what oh. you do if your dog's not food motivated. Okay. I trained that type of dog for two years. My dog would, play, people were like, can I give your dog a hot dog? She'd play with it and walk away. Maybe she didn't like hot dogs. No, well, all wet food. All wet yeah. food, all any food. Um, you can also use, if they have a favorite toy for a while, if yeah. that's what you're doing, you can hide the toy and have them find the toy instead of using food while you're yeah. still trying to figure that so out. So the point was you can use toys instead of food. But yeah. I'm, I have never found a dog who could go without eating. Dogs got to eat. And you may try, you can try everything under the sun. You will find something your dog likes, and they will eat it, and they will be happy about it. Um, yeah? Um, what sort of what mental stimulation exercises would you work with a blind dog? Ah, smells. All smells. Um, what, so you have a blind dog? Yeah. And blind have you? Blind border collie. Blind border collie. Um, blind and deaf or just blind? Just blind. Blind. Always blind? Born blind? Yeah, born blind. Okay. And is this a new dog or? Um, it's about eight years old now. Okay. So the, and you've had this dog for eight years? Um, seven and a half. Okay. So the question is about uh, mental stimulation for a blind dog. Um, and this is an eight-year-old border collie, born blind. So what do you do now? Um, now it's usually just taking them on walks and letting them play with the neighbor's dog yeah. um, and roam around their backyard. We also take them to the farm near us and let them uh, roam around the chicken coop and the uh, goat and take time. Sounds like your dog already has a pretty enriched life. Um, well, but more yeah, um, you can hide food. And you can, I have a blind cat. Um, but so a lot of it is, um, I'm trying to think of things that, I think if your dog knows his way around, his or her, his way around the house, then there's always something that you can do to, you know, hide food or spray interesting smells. Um, you can look at what some of the shelters, the animal shelters do for enrichment. And one of the things they do is they have these scent sticks. You know, they, they s saturate a cloth or something with a smell and maybe put it inside a, a tube with some holes in it. So anything you can do around smells, like introducing new smells. Um, and then, but if he's able to go for walks and play and um, also, he probably can, I mean, does he play with toys? No. Can he, or he just doesn't want to? He doesn't really like toys as yeah. much. Like palms and peanut butter jars he yeah. likes, but any yeah. sort of like squeaky toy he's just afraid of. 
afraid of. Yeah, a lot of dogs are afraid of squeakies. Um, I know my, my blind cat likes to chase, you know, like a wand toy, so maybe a flirt pole. But I think there's probably, I mean, you know your dog best, so there's probably, you know, you can experiment with any of those things. I don't think any of those activities are contraindicated for a blind dog. But it's kind of hard because he doesn't really like any sort of like toys. Yeah. Well, it sounds like he's getting his mental stimulation from other things. So, yeah. We have ideas about what our dogs need from us, and we're often right, but it sounds like you're doing a great job of making his world interesting and fulfilling. So, good job. like in the cold weather when it's too cold to like be outside for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just short bursts of activity, yeah. Luckily, it's warming up. Yeah? Um, for the instances where you're hiding the food, how do you get them to eat the food and not eat the Legos? <laughs> oh, OK, that's a good point. That's a good point, because there are dogs, like, there are a lot of dogs who will, I don't know if they have, like, uh, very limber lips and tongues, or they really just don't want to eat stuff that's not food. Um, and then there are the dogs who don't really mind whether it's food or not. And if you have a dog that has a tendency to eat non-food items, that the Legos might not be the best <laughs> substrate for the kibbles. So the question was, sorry, the question was, what do you do to make sure if your dog is like diving in, looking for food in a box of Legos or some or a small object, how do you keep your dog from eating the Legos. And so the answer is, if they have a tendency to eat that stuff, maybe play a different game or have larger, you know, have toys. Have the dog's own toys, because as long as your dog doesn't eat his own toys, then you'll have better luck with that. Yeah? What's your opinion of the dog in daycare places? <sighs> it depends. <laughs> It depends. Um, it depends on the place, and it also depends on your dog. Some places have a half-day option, and that's kind of an interesting idea, because not every dog wants to play with other dogs all day long, just like not every person wants to be surrounded by even their favorite friends all day long, every single day. So there's also the question, are you bringing your dog? See, when I first got my dog, I was just starting out as learning how to be a trainer. It was about seven years ago, eight years, seven years ago. And I was a new trainer, and I was trying to do all the things, do it all right. Um, oh, the question was, what do you think about doggy daycare? And the answer is, it depends. And now I'm saying why. Um, I thought I was doing it for my dog's benefit. And when I went to pick her up, you want a place, you know, we talked about some of the criteria for choosing a place. One of the criteria, I would say, is um, a place that gives you kind of like a, not a report card, but like just a kind of a record of the day. And I would always get this report about my dog that said she needed a calming break. And then as she went more times, she needed more calming breaks, which meant she was getting kind of over aroused and her play was turning into like get off me and she had to be separated and kind of calmed down and I'll tell you it kind of annoyed me that they didn't ever say to me maybe your dog doesn't really like daycare that much but eventually I thought maybe my dog just doesn't like daycare that much and my final decision came when I boarded her at this place. And this place was a very responsible, highly reputable place. It's just that my dog, because of who she is, she just didn't really enjoy that kind of environment for that length of time. I boarded her over Christmas for about four weeks, uh, four, sorry, <laughs> four days. When I picked her up, she had um, bloody diarrhea for several days. And that's stress, you know. It went away, you know, two days and it was gone. But that's, it was just too much. And so know your dog and really investigate your daycare. 
And think about why you're doing it. If you're doing it to give your dog a chance to play supervised with other dogs and your dog likes that, it could be a good option now and then. Or it might not be. So um, you and then you. I hate to say you. I'm sorry. Um, uh, give us an example or explain some brain games beyond just find it. Like I know that's a very popular one or something mm -hmm. um, Just I, I don't know what other brain games are, are out there. So maybe it might be helpful. Yeah. Um, that's you can you can obviously you can look at the book for more ideas. Um, one of the things, one of the one of my favorite things in there is just this idea of like putting treats in a basket. So it's not necessarily like when we talk. Are there, you're keep on giving examples of things using food and treat motivation, but are there other things that are beyond like you know food motivated ways to stimulate your dog? Uh, like that would be the brain games, or are the brain games always with food? There were a lot of examples, actually, of outings and right. walks. And we wouldn't call those brain games, right? Maybe I'm confused. What I mean by brain games, well, I didn't use the term brain games. That's the name of the book. Mental stimulation is anything that draws on a dog's instinctive behaviors and gives them an opportunity to express them. So just all different ways of letting dogs be dogs within our world. So yeah, sure. <laughs> what was your question? Well, I was just going to follow up with the question about the, the uh, daycare. One of, I think it's one of the trainers who comes here, or maybe it's one like someone who writes a lot of books about training. Robin? Um, it's, well, what they say is that um, you know, the young dogs prefer daycare more than older dogs. And, and I think that's true for my dog. Um, yeah. You know, when they're older, they don't really want to be around a whole bunch of other dogs. It's not really their idea of a good time. Yeah. So the 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 comment was um, that a lot for a lot of dogs, they may enjoy that kind of daycare environment more as puppies and young dogs, and as they get older, not so much. And it's true. I mean, you you can see dogs age out of play. A lot of dogs just age out of playing with other dogs. They just don't get as enthusiastic about it. Yeah, so thanks for that comment. It's, I, I've, I've seen it, to, I see it to be true. Yeah, and I've seen people bring their dogs to a dog park and the dog is like, ah! And people say, oh, he has to learn to play with other dogs, <laughs> which is, I don't, I don't mean to laugh at a person who says that, it's just that he really doesn't have to play with other dogs. Some dogs would rather play with you. Yeah. I have a question about playing with Hug. Uh -huh. So um, if you decide it's time to end the game for whatever reason, maybe the dog is able to fully turn it or something. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how do you end it? My, I think I heard you say that you drop it and then it's no more fun. Yes, I keep forgetting because I just want to talk to you. <laughs> so the question is about Tug ending the game. Is it better to um, require the dog to relinquish the Tug or is it okay to let the dog like go off with it triumphantly in his, its mouth and let them win or is it better to just drop the toy and you know it becomes a dead toy and it's not fun anymore or do you trade or do you treat? My feeling about Tug is, and games in general, are they're just for fun. And if your dog wins, if your dog thinks, ha ha, I won, what's the consequence going to be? Um, if you have a dog who's a little insecure or shy or fearful and you let them win the game, maybe it builds their confidence a little bit. 
if you have a pushy, bossy dog who's always grabbing stuff and you know, not wanting to give it back, then maybe you want to use tug as an opportunity to reinforce behaviors that are like, you know, um, build impulse control and self-control and discipline. Like, you know, I ask you to give and you give it to me and immediately we start to play again. And then, but if it's too hard for your dog, if your dog doesn't know drop it or give or, you know, then you can use a treat take it away. But I think, to me, I'm not too worried about my dog thinking that she won because I'm still the boss. You know, when you talk about like, oh, I don't want my dog to be dominant, it, you know, it, the thing is that you're always dominant because you control all the resources. You control when the, your dog gets to go out, when your dog gets to come in, you control when your dog gets fed, you control everything that your dog wants. You know, if you've, if you've, I mean, now and then your dog gets something that you didn't want them to have that they really wanted to have, and that's just the life of the dog. But in general, you're in charge. Think of it as like you're the mom or you're the dad. It's more like that than like you're alpha. You know, you're not trying to, um, you know, keep your dog down so they don't become, um, you know, alpha because what would they do then? They would like empty your bank account and they would, you know, they're, they're just, I mean, they're, they're opportunities to, to, to um, you know, get for it to go to their head are pretty minimal. So I'd say I like to use tug as a way to practice self-control with my dog and to play. So playing is fun and then, you know, I ask her to drop it or I just stop, so I, I just stop tugging often she'll open her mouth. Um, but it, I think it's a nice, any, any play is a nice way to kind of reinforce um, calm. And in that case, you don't need treats, you just go right back to playing. When you ask your dog to do something and then they do it, then you go right back to playing. And that's the reward. It's a beautiful day, I think everybody wants to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.